Thank you, praise team. What awesome, powerful music today. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Muno and the, who was it? The planets. You know, one, I guess the two things that are synonymous that go hand in hand are clearly evident today, that I'm getting older, it, it is my birthday, and a very good sign of that is up until a few moments ago, I didn't know who Muno and the planets even were. So I guess that's a sign of getting older. I'm assuming they must be one of the newer, younger hip bands. Am I wrong? Am I really out of touch? Oh, well. You know, one of the other great things about getting older is the older you get, the less you care. The less you care. We've been talking about faith for the last three weeks, and today we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Now, we're not going to finish, because finish is what God wants you to do because of faith. But we are going to conclude our study today. If you were here with us three weeks back when we began, we looked at the basics, that faith begins in a belief. Have you put your belief in God that He is the Almighty Creator and the Maker of all that we see? Or have you put your faith in science that this world got here by evolution? You know, as I shared, uh, it's probably been a year or so ago now, but the scientists and their whole concept of how we came about is that out of this micro global glue, goo, that something crawled out of it one day. That that something became something else, and it became something else. That fins became feathers, and feathers became fingers. And there's a lot of this world, a lot of this nation that believes that very thing today. But as I shared back then, according to their belief, we came from goo and went to zoo, and now you're you. If you believe what they teach. But the belief. That's where faith begins. And we looked at once you put that belief. That faith and that trust in God. The first thing that happens in your life is a blessing. The blessing of a changed life. A changed heart. You understand now just how blessed you are. That God has given you life. And created this world. And everything in it. And that you in turn become a blessing. And then that blessing leads to building, just as God called Noah to build the ark, that we are to be building our lives. In the week after that, we also saw that faith doesn't often tell us where. God doesn't tell us where he's going to lead us. He just promises to be with us every step of the way. Faith doesn't tell us how. When we see God do the impossible, he's not going to explain to us the how of how he does it. But we do see. And the Bible teaches us the why. And the who. Behind the faith. And then last week. We looked at the power of faith. Over such things as fear. And foolishness. And so today we're going to conclude. With three more. Three of the last aspects of faith. But the major difference. In there is faith, first of all, we need to understand that there is faith in God. And then there is faith in anything else. And the major difference in, two, in these two are this. That all other things that we may have faith in, in this life and in this world, can fail us. Can disappoint us. Can betray us. God is the only one who will never disappoint us in faith. Now, I'm not saying to you that he'll always give you what you ask. But true faith in God and in his perfect plan is the only thing that we will ever place faith in in our lives that will never disappoint. You know, faith is part of everyday living. Think about it. When you're sick, you go to a doctor whose name you can't pronounce. He gives you a prescription you cannot read. You take it to a pharmacist you've never seen before. He gives you medication that you don't understand, and yet you take it. Now, that's living by faith. You know, if I stand on the ground floor at Cape Fear Valley Hospital, and I want to go up to the eighth floor, 
which is the top. And I press the button for the elevator. I am confident. I have faith that that elevator is going to arrive. Matter of fact, Cape Fear Valley's got some of the fastest I've ever seen in how quick they get you up and down. And indeed, every time I go up there, unless, of course, one of them's out of order, it does arrive. And the door opens. Now I am presented with a vehicle that I am confident. In other words, I have faith that it will take me to the top of that hospital, provided one thing, that I step inside. That I step inside. When I do, my faith in that elevator takes the form of personal trust. I step into it, and it does the rest. Listen, my faith in the elevator does not empower the elevator. It simply trusts in the elevator's power to take me to the floor that I want to go to. Faith is simply stepping into Christ, trusting in His power to save me, to lead me, to guide me through this journey you and I call life. Take your Bibles and stand with me this morning. This is my Bible, the light into my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert, my ears are open, my heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> if you haven't already, turn with me in that Bible to Hebrews 11. We're going to conclude with the last 10 verses of the chapter today. Beginning in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Because God had provided something better for us. So that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Father, as we look into your word again this day and as we conclude this series on this oh so powerful word, faith. This word, Lord, that teaches us in your word itself that without it is impossible to please you. Father, we know that without faith, we cannot be saved. We cannot come to a saving knowledge of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But Lord, your faith, I believe, was put in place for much more than our salvation. But to lead us on this journey called life. To allow us to trust in you regardless of the circumstances, and regardless, Lord, of what may seem impossible. That, Father, you would help us to learn and to apply to our lives, to be able to see the result of our faith when we're willing to live by it. And we ask you, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, this very day, through the teaching and preaching of your word, to increase our faith, that we may put all of our trust in you. 
We ask you these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Verse 30 begins by telling us here, as the author is concluding in the 11th chapter, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been circled for seven days. Y'all have heard the one about the preacher when he was wanting to find out how things were going in the church and especially how well that the children were being educated in Bible knowledge and stuff in Sunday school and children's church and stuff. So one Sunday morning, he decided to go over and he would just find out in person and visit in hand. And he decided he would go into the 5th and 6th grade class. And so as he went into the class, before they got into their lesson, he was sitting there just having some small talk with all the children and stuff. And there were two young boys in the church who had been in the church all their life, but they were synonymous for being troublemakers. More or less, most of the time when something was going on in the church, some type of mischief, they were either involved in it or they were the ringleaders of it. And they happened to be in this particular class. But so as the preacher sitting there having a conversation with them, at one point he finally looks at the class and he says, well, somebody tell me, please, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And there was silence. And the preacher said, well, maybe y'all didn't hear me. I want to ask you again, class, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And he was kind of scanning the class like I am now. And then finally he zeroed in on them two boys and just kind of looked at them for a moment knowing that more than anything else, even though they were troublemakers, they'd been in church from the time that they were born. And finally, one of them looked up at him and said, Preacher, we don't know, but we didn't do it. <laughs> and the other one said, We didn't, Preacher. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I promise we didn't do it. And the preacher just kind of put his head down and said, I can't believe this. And he looked over at the Sunday school teacher and he said, Can you believe what they just said to me? And the Sunday school teacher said, well, preacher, I want to tell you, I've known these boys all my life, and if they said they didn't do it, <laughs> then they didn't do it. I, I believe them. I trust them. The preacher by now was beside himself. He couldn't believe it. He said, I cannot believe this. Where is the Sunday school director? So he got up and left the class, and he walked around until he found the Sunday school director, and he said, I want to tell you what I've just experienced in our 5th and 6th grade class. I simply asked that class who knocked down the walls of Jericho. And Billy and Bobby over there, they blurted out, Preacher, we didn't do it. And he looked at him and he said, and before I could say anything, I looked at the Sunday school teacher and all he did was defended them. And he said if they didn't do it, he believed them because he'd known them all his life. Can you believe that? And the Sunday school director looked at him a minute and he said, Preacher, listen, I'm not sure about them boys, but I've known that Sunday school teacher my whole life. And if he says he believes them boys, I believe him. And I'm telling you, I don't believe them boys did it. But I tell you what I'll do. I'll go talk to the finance chairman and we'll see if we can't take it out of general fund and fix that wall so you won't have to take up a special offering for it. I hope that's not the case in our Sunday school. Three final aspects of faith I want us to finish with today. Three things that actually tell us how faith works and who faith works through. The first one we find here in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. The first thing I want you to see this morning is this. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Joshua and the people of Israel had an impossible task and a, a circumstance before them. They had basically impenetrable walls. If you've ever studied and or maybe heard me even in the past talk about it, and I'm not going to use the time this morning, but these walls were unbelievable. These walls were so thick they could actually drive a horse and chariot on the top of them, not to mention their height. And God has told Joshua, if you'll circle the city seven times, those walls will fall. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the account, but you find it in Joshua chapter 5. They've crossed over the Jordan River. They are now in 
the desert right outside of the city of Jericho. And Joshua was kind of walking around one evening, and he's surveying the city. He's looking at the walls, and I'm sure he's probably wondering to himself, how in the world are we going to capture this city? How in the world are we going to capture this city? The Bible even says that the city was shut up tight because they knew Israel was out there. So nobody was coming in and nobody was going out. So all Joshua was seeing is this massive fortified city wall and also believing that they're going to conquer them. And lo and behold, he looks up and who is standing there but Jesus himself. Now, the Bible doesn't identify him that way at that time. It calls him the captain of the Lord's, or the captain, the, the host of the Lord's army. But he's standing there with a sword in his hand. And Joshua walks up to him. And he says, are you for us or against us? And Jesus replies, no. No. The answer to your question is no. But that wasn't a yes or no question. Joshua said, are you for us or are you for them? And he says, no. What I believe he was trying to tell Joshua was, no, you don't understand. It ain't about this side and that side. It ain't about your side and the other side. It ain't about this side and the enemy. It's about what God is going to accomplish. That's what it's about. It ain't about God taking sides. God don't take sides. God takes over. So his answer was no to Joshua's question. But they begin to converse. And Joshua, he's telling Joshua what's going to transpire. And I'm sure at some point Joshua's got to be thinking, then he's going to say, Okay, and then y'all going to put ladders on the wall, or then y'all going to get a big old log, and you're going to start ramming the gate. God doesn't say anything about that. He doesn't say anything using any kind of reason and logic that Joshua knows of as how you were to conquer a city. He says, here's what I want you to do. Gather up everybody every day, and for the first six days, walk around that city. Don't say a word. Matter of fact, you tell the people to be silent and walk around that city. And then on the seventh day, I want you to do the same thing, but I want everybody to go around it seven times. And on the seventh and final time that you come around that city, there's going to be some trumpeteers, and when they blast their trumpets, you tell everybody to shout. Just to give out a big old hearty holler. And when they do, the walls will fall. Now, don't you know the human side of Joshua had to be thinking, now, wait a minute. We're not going to ram it. We're not going to make ladders. We're not going to attack. We're going to circle in silence, and then we're going to shout. But God said, when we do, the walls will fall. And guess what? They did. And the walls fell. The walls fell down. There's still archaeological evidence to this day of some of what they believe to be the remnants of that wall. And amazingly enough, in those situations, most of the time when a city is overwhelmed like that, when it's attacked, the walls fall in. In this particular occasion, the walls fell outward. Outward. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Do you have an impossible situation in your life right now? Do you have an impossible situation in your life personally? Maybe something going on in your family? Maybe something in the workplace? And you see absolutely no way this thing is going to work out to your benefit or your family's benefit or whatever the situation may require. It just seems impossible. And everywhere you turn, it don't seem to look any better. It seems to look worse. Faith accomplishes the impossible. It accomplishes the impossible. Joshua took God at his word. 
and he saw the impossible accomplished. Now, granted, Joshua had seen God do it many times before. He'd seen God split the Red Sea. He'd seen God bring water from rocks. He'd seen God feed them for 40 years from snowflakes or that fell from heaven every morning. He'd seen a whole lot of things that you and I haven't seen. But if you're living by faith, you can testify along with me today that, no, I've never seen any of those miracles, but I can tell you today I've seen some. I've seen some. I've experienced some. I've received some, and I've lived some. Faith accomplishes the impossible. About 20 years ago, Billy Graham was doing a crusade at Shea Stadium in New York. And the airplanes from LaGuardia Airport flew over the stadium. There were dozens of them by the hour. And if you've ever been to New York Airport, you understand it. I mean, it's uh, unbelievable just to see the planes lined up waiting to take off. But on the opening night of their counselor's training, because normally before they do those crusades, they have to have a whole army of hundreds of people, not only the choir they use, but all these counselors that they have to train to be able to respond to people at the end because naturally Billy Graham and his staff can't talk to everyone when there's such a, a great response. But on the opening night of their counselors' training, Billy Graham was up there talking from the podium. And these planes kept flying overhead and it seemed like they got louder and louder. And then finally, at some point, they said he just stopped and kind of looked up and watched about two or three of them when he went over and he said, we're going to have to do something about this noise. This just won't do. And so he bowed his head right there at that same podium and he said a simple prayer and he said, Lord, we just want to ask you to shift the winds and send these planes in another direction or do whatever you need to do so we're able to hear tonight and to get ourselves prepared for your work. Some of the counselors were actually shocked that he would pray to prayer like that and didn't know what to expect. But God did it. God did that very thing. They noticed strangely in less than an hour, the airplanes had quit flying overhead. They could still hear them in the distance, but they weren't coming overhead anymore. And lo and behold, would you believe the next morning in the New York Times, there was an article in there that reported how the winds had shifted so dramatically the night before that airplanes actually had to be rerouted at a Shea Stadium. For the next week, Billy Graham preached a crusade in that stadium. And for the next week, those winds remained there and those planes had to be directed. The day or the evening that stadium was over, I mean his crusade was over, they said the next day, the winds returned to their normal pattern and the airplanes returned to theirs. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Listen, some of us, and I believe there's still a few of us left here now, got to see one of those very things at a Billy Graham crusade ourselves. Before Charlotte ever played its first football game in that stadium in Charlotte, Billy Graham preached the gospel in that stadium. And we got to go and take our youth up there. And that night we went, there were two bands, one of them were a young Christian rock band. I think it was the Jesus Freaks, or maybe that was the song they sang. But I mean, obnoxiously loud. You know how rock and roll is inside of this stadium. But they were playing as well as Michael W. Smith. But I can tell you that night it was raining so hard, so hard between umbrellas and ponchos on your head even with a rock and roll band playing, you could barely even hear the music. You could barely hear it. All you could hear was the pounding of the rain, either on your head if you had a poncho or on the umbrella over your head. It was a constant roar. From the moment that man walked out from behind stage and got about three steps up the steps to the stage, it was as if somebody said, And turned off the rain and it stopped. And you could have heard a pin drop in that stadium. God will accomplish the impossible when we put our faith in Him. Faith alone saves. But the faith that saves is never alone, according to John Calvin. But we have to make sure 
that our faith is in Him. In Him and in Him alone. There are so many other things that we can put our faith in. Charles Spurgeon used to tell a story about two men in a boat. And they were caught in a very, very severe rapids. And they were going to a place where there was a powerful waterfall. And as they neared the waterfall, the rapids got even worse. So they knew if they ever got to those last rapids, there was no way they would ever make it. They were beginning to struggle for their lives just trying to paddle that boat to one side of the river to get out of its current. And as they were being carried swiftly downstream, they were carried toward these rocks, and all of a sudden the boat flipped, and out come the two men. So now they're in the water, struggling with the current. There was a couple of other guys that happened to be on the shore and saw the whole thing transpiring, and one of them threw a rope out there to try and save both of them. And at the same time, one man grabbed the rope, and he was saved. He began to pull himself in as the others were pulling back. But at the same time, the other guy that could have grabbed the rope, instead he panicked, and he grabbed hold of instead a log that was floating by. And it was a fatal mistake. One man was drawn to shore because he had a connection with the people on the land. The other was clinging to a log that was carried down through the rapids. They actually never even found his body again. Faith, it does, what it does in a sense is kind of like that story. It gives you a connection with the shore. It gives you a connection, more importantly, to Jesus Christ. And grabbing hold of anything else is kind of like grabbing that log. It might go along with you, but it's not only going to not save you, all it's going to do is accompany you to your doom. God can accomplish the impossible, but it doesn't mean he always will. Sometimes even faith in God can be somewhat misguided and disappointed. Philip Yancey in his book, Disappointment with God, tells a story about an earlier time in his life, and he said he was searching hard for evidence of God, that he'd been brought up in church and he'd heard the stories, but he was just going through one of those times he needed to know for himself that God was real. And he said one day he thought he'd found it, of all places on the television. While he was randomly flipping through the dials, he came across a mass healing service being conducted by a woman by the name of Catherine Coleman who has a TV ministry. And he said he watched for a few minutes as she brought all these various people up on the stage and interviewed them. And each one of them told an amazing story of a supernatural healing. Some of them with cancer, some with heart condition, some with paralysis. She, he said it was kind of like a medical encyclopedia up there. But he watched that program, and he said even as he watched it, the doubts began to drift away. And he felt like he'd found something real and tangible. Coleman asked a musician to save her favorite song, which was He Touched Me. And he said, man, that was his favorite song too. And he just knew that that was God confirming it to him, that this was real and he had given him evidence. It was like a personal touch from God. Three weeks later, she came to a neighboring state of where Philip Yancey lived at the time. And he said he actually skipped college classes and traveled a half a day to attend one of her meetings. He said the atmosphere was unbelievably charged. Soft organ music in the background, the murmur of people praying aloud, some of them in tongues. And every few minutes there was a happy interruption when somebody in the congregation or the crowd would, would yell out, I'm healed, I've been healed. But he said one person made, especially made an impression. It was a man from Milwaukee who had been carried into the meeting on a stretcher. And when he walked, yes, he walked on stage, he said everybody in there just cheered wildly. The man actually told him he was a physician. And he said he was even more impressed. He had incurable lung cancer, and he'd been told he had six months to live. But now, tonight, he believed that God had healed him. He was walking for the first time in months. He said he felt great. He praised God. He even wrote down the man's name. He said he practically floated out of that meeting that night. He had never known such certainty of faith before. He said his search was over. He had seen the proof of a living God in those people on the stage. And if he could work those miracles in them, then surely he had something wonderful in store for him. He said he wanted to contact this man that he'd seen at the meeting. So much so that exactly one week, week later, he phoned the directory assistants in Milwaukee and he got the physician's number. 
And when he dialed it, a woman answered. And he said, may I speak to Dr. So-and-so, please? And there was a long silence. And finally, she said, who are you? He said he figured she was just screening calls from patients or something. So he gave her his name, and he told her how much he admired Dr. So-and-so, and he wanted to talk to him ever since the Catherine Coleman meeting. He said, I've just been so moved by his story. He said there was another long silence. And then she spoke in a flat, flat voice, pronouncing each word slowly. And she said, my husband is dead. Just that one sentence. Nothing more. And she hung up. Sometimes even our faith can be misguided. Not when it's putting God himself, but in the wrong people who are supposedly representing him and how they represent him. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Look at verse 31. By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Faith not only accomplishes the impossible, faith invites the improbable. Faith not only accomplishes the impossible, faith invites the improbable. You know, I'd never really noticed this till we did one of the Dr. Tony Evans studies a year or two back, and he touched on some of the verses here in Hebrews. But he was absolutely right. Poor old Rahab can't get a break. Anywhere and everywhere the Bible mentions Rahab, it always has to add those other two words. The harlot. The harlot. Poor sister just can't get a break. In the Old Testament, she's Rahab the harlot. In the New Testament, she's still Rahab the harlot. Every time we find her name mentioned in the Bible, it don't just tell us Rahab. It reminds us that she was the harlot. And what's amazing about that is nowhere in the Bible does I find it that says Moses is the murderer, even though he murdered. Nowhere do I find where it says Jacob the deceiver, even though Jacob, that's what his name actually meant. Trickster, deceiver. But poor old Rahab don't seem to be able to get a break. Everywhere the Bible mentions Rahab, it reminds us that she was the harlot. Why? Why? Why don't God cut Rahab a little slack? Because God doesn't want us to ever, ever forget that faith invites the improbable. Who more improbable to be greatly used by God than a harlot, a hooker, a prostitute, whatever word, definition, term you want to use. They all mean the same thing. Part of the reason that the spies went to her house is because they knew it wouldn't attract any attention. Everybody knew everybody's business in those days. Everybody knew if a stranger came into town. That was an easy place for them to be able to go without it seeming out of place. But even then, everybody knew they were there. Because it didn't take long for the king to get word they were there. That they were there to spy out the land, which was the truth. But what about this woman, Rahab? Notice it says, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient. Every single person in Jericho, baby, child, teenager, young adult, middle-aged adult, senior citizen, every one of them died except for this woman and her family. It's kind of like the story of Noah. Every person in that entire city, thousands, may have been several hundred thousand, all perished except for this one woman 
and all those who were a part of her family because of her faith. In spite of the fact that she was the harlot. And what is amazing to me is, I'll bet you there were thousands of people, thousands, that if you'd have went to the city of Jericho, some of their neighbors would have said, man, he's a good man. He's a good man. She's a good woman. Them's good folk right there. They're good people. They're good, 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 good. And all them good people perished. But yet a harlot and her family were saved because of her faith. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Faith invites the improbable. Actually, turn with me just a moment to Joshua chapter 2. I want you to see a little bit for yourself about this woman's faith. Joshua chapter 2. Now here the spies have came to her house. She has hidden them on the roof. The king's already come looking for them. She's lied to the king and said, yes, they were here, but they've left. They went out of the gate. They're headed out of town. If you'll hurry up and go look for them, you'll be able to probably catch up to them on the road. And we're going to pick up in verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that the terror of you has fallen on us. And that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. You know, what else is amazing about this story? In the original, if you recall, Moses had sent 12 spies. Ten out of 12 come back and said, you can't take that land. Them people are like giants. And we're like grasshoppers. So basically, 10 out of 12 come back and told Moses, as we looked, they grew. They grew in our sight. They grew before our eyes, their size, their statue. But notice what Rahab says here. We've heard word about you, and all the inhabitants of the land have melted away. This time, they're not growing in size and statue in their eyes. They're melting like candle wax. But notice also, this time, Joshua was a little wiser than Moses. He didn't send 12. He knew, with that many folks, you got trouble. He sent two. Two men. Two that he knew had faith to begin with. Verse 10, she goes on. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and to Og whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Notice what she tells him. I know who your God is. We've heard. Matter of fact, we've been waiting on y'all 40 years. Where you been? We heard about when he split the Red Sea 40 years ago. That's how long it's been. We've been waiting on y'all to come. And for 40 years, she not only knew they were coming, she knew that what was currently theirs was fixing to be, or currently hers, her people's, Jericho's, was fixing to be theirs. Because through her faith, She has put all of her trust in God. So much so that she's willing to betray, in a sense, even the people of her own city. And I'm sure much like Noah, they probably wouldn't have listened to her if she would have tried to talk to them. Faith accomplishes the impossible. It invites the improbable. A prostitute of all people out of an entire city of people. There was a young Colombian girl who received a New Testament in school one day. She took it home with her, and she was so excited, and she began to read the New Testament until one day her father called her reading it. 
And he told her not to read that book anymore, that he better not see it in her hands because it was full of lies and fantasy. But the girl kept on reading it. Until one day her father came home again unexpectedly and he found her with the New Testament. He grabbed it out of her hands and he stuck it in his pocket. The father went off to work. He turned out to be a mining engineer. Several hours later, sirens went off in the community where there had been a cave-in at the mine. The father was trapped in the mine. The rescue workers, it actually took them five days to reach the men. But even when they got there, it was too late. All 31 men had died. You may remember the story. It's been about 10, 12 years ago on the news now, including the father of this little girl. But curiously, when those rescue workers found him, he was clutching that little New Testament between what appeared to be praying hands. And when they opened the front cover, they read a note. And it said, to my daughter, keep reading this. It is true and right. And I'll see you in heaven one day. Then they turned to the back page where the father had signed the commitment card after he himself had said the sinner's prayer. But that wasn't the end of the story. Turning to the very back page, which was supposed to be blank, there were signed the names of all 30 other mine workers beneath the father. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Faith invites the improbable. Don't ever think that somebody is beyond God's reach. I don't care how long you've known them, how you may believe their life will never change, can't be turned around. And lastly, verse 32, And what more shall I say, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, Daniel, quenched the power of fire, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, escaped the edge of the sword, Elijah, from weakness were made strong, Israel, became mighty in war, Joshua and God's people, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection, and other ex others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Faith accomplishes the impossible. Faith invites the improbable. And faith involves the available. That's who these people were. Sometimes I believe we look back and we've studied and read their stories about their lives so much we put them on a pedestal. We think they were some kind of superhero or they had some kind of powers or something or because they lived in a different time than you and I. They were regular people just like me and you. They were regular people. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those whom he calls. You know, and when it comes to him accomplishing great things in your life and in mine, it has nothing to do with your personal abilities. It has everything to do with your availability. God, here I am. Use me. Do your thing. Do your stuff. Now, I want you to notice, don't think that the Bible's contradicting itself. It's telling us here that there were kingdoms conquered. There were the mouths of lines shut. There were the power of fire was quenched. That, that many of these things God promised that he did. But then when it gets 
to verse 39, it says, And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. It's not talking about the promises God made to them during their lives. We saw that he did that too. He saved Daniel from the lions. He saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. He did that, but yet it's almost saying as if they didn't get the promise. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the promise of that which is to come. It's talking about the promise of the kingdom, the new heaven, the new earth, all that God has in store for us. It's talking about the promise of the new body that we're going to receive. And notice what it says. Because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Those saints are still waiting. They haven't got their resurrected bodies yet. Do you know when they get them? The same moment that you and I do. Because it's going to be something God had something better in mind. Something that's for all of us at the same exact time. So listen. If you're going to receive your resurrected body at the same moment that Joseph did. And Joshua did. And Moses did. And Abraham did. What does that tell you? It's not about our abilities it's about our availability it's about what we will allow God to do through us and I want us to look at I know it's running late look at the last three verses of chapter or the first three of chapter 12 the author says therefore in light of all we've looked at in chapter 11 beginning with the basics going all the way to the hall of faith And all that God has accomplished throughout time. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. All these that he's talked about. All those that have come before us. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Hours. Behind the last runner in front of him, the last marathoner finally entered the Olympic Stadium. By that time, the drama of the day's events was pretty much practically over and most of the spectators had already left. But this athlete's story was still being played out. Limping into the arena, the Tanzanian runner grimaced with every step. His knee bleeding and bandaged from an earlier fall in the race. His ragged appearance immediately caught the attention of those few that were remaining in the stands and who actually began to cheer him on to the finish line why did he stay in the race what made him endure injuries and keep on running when he was hours hours behind the other runners when asked these questions by a reporter after the race he replied my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race they sent me 7,000 miles to finish it Folks, the same is true for you and I. God didn't send his son how many thousands of miles it is from heaven to earth to give you and I salvation just so that we would simply be with him one day. That's the ultimate goal of our salvation. But it's so that we would finish the race. Finish the course. And notice again it sells us in 12.1. We have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding. All those who have come before us. I wonder sometimes if there's actually some bleachers in heaven that God lets them have glimpses to look down and to cheer. To cheer for the church. To cheer for you and I. Because what they had entrusted to them has now been given to us. You know, this evening, we're going to be watching the ultimate, or some of us anyway, of sports events, the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 51. 
an event that's going to be televised basically all over the world, watched by over a hundred million viewers in various forms. And all those players for both teams that will be putting on their uniforms and playing that game, playing, we know, ultimately to call themselves a champion, but they're going to be playing for their teams. They're going to be playing for their families. They're going to be playing for their fans. They will play for them. They will want to win for them. They will be performing for all those millions of people that they know are watching, not only across this nation, but I believe all across the globe. But I believe there's one group of people gathered, that many of which, not all, but many of which will actually probably be in that stadium somewhere tonight. Those that will be there watching that I believe are more important to those players and their performance than all the others. I believe that there's a select group of people that are going to be watching that game tonight that when it comes to the performers themselves, they are more concerned with what this one group thinks than they are with their own families or friends or their fans. You know most of them, or at least know them by name anyway. They'll be gathered. Some of them might even be talked to. You already know many of their names. Names like Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and Emmett Smith and Joe Theismann and John Elway, Michael Irvin, Terry Bradshaw, Howie Long. The list goes on and on and on. Who are all these guys? The former players. Those who have come before them and have already played this game at the highest ultimate level that it exists in the world. And so I believe when those two teams, the Patriots and the Falcons, take the field tonight, more so than what their families think and their friends and even their fans, who they're really tuned into and who they're really worried about what they think, all these guys that have come before them, the ones who paved the way, the ones who helped lay some of the foundation because they know they're part of a team or part of something that most of you and I will never be a part of. But how much more true is that for the church? Moses may be watching you. Abraham may give you a cheer. We don't get to see it or hear it this side of heaven. But the Bible says that all these that have came before us are now a great cloud of witnesses watching us. How well are you doing on your journey of faith? And when your day comes and God calls you home, will you and I be able to say the words as the Apostle Paul did. I have kept the faith. I have finished the course. I have completed the race. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the gift of faith. And, Lord, I pray that you would help us to know, to understand in a deeper way than we ever have that faith, our faith in you accomplishes the impossible. That that very faith invites the improbable, including ourselves. And that that faith involves the available. It has nothing to do with our social standing, our heritage, our background, our human ability, but simply our availability used by you. Father, we pray, increase our faith, that we may trust in you more with each day that passes, that we may bring you greater glory and honor and greater growth in your kingdom. We ask you these and all things in Christ's name.